So a lot of you will know Martin him. He Hase doesn't need Maha. much Wir introduction. Well, we, let's welcome Martin Hase or Maha. Das ist die falsche Sprache. So now we're talking about the language of populists and make sure that this time you don't pay too much attention. Don't learn this kind of language because it's the populists. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich glaube, ich werde das erste Mal ins Französisch übersetzt. Das ist schon was Besonderes. Also ich kann auch Französisch, also die Sprache. Ähm, so this is nice. Uh, actually, the, the first time I'm... Trotzdem, vielen Dank dafür. Also, ich ganz my talk has been translated so, into French yeah, and I speak French myself, so I'm definitely going to listen to that. Later on, uh, we're talking und about the German language, though, now here in, in particular, the language of populists. And, and I'm going, going to show you some, some video clips. Uh, if there's something to be learned, uh, uh, from that, maybe uh, you can also look at look at the journalists um, really concentrating and on on their interview partners. Uh, watch what they're doing. Uh, there are some strange, uh, strange conversation situations, and so the way in which you ask ask questions, maybe even surprising questions, will will yield surprising answers. But first of all, let's uh, let's talk about what is a populism. So I'd like to start out with a clip just to give you an impression, but I will give a, a more abstract definition later on. But we get this first explanation here. My criticism is that you don't speak the truth. About refugees? No, you don't speak the truth. Ever since this whole drama started. Why are you here tonight? Because this is all bullshit. What exactly? What exactly? The Germany is turning into an Islamic state, and the poor Christians who are dying down there, head off. If you know the Holy Quran, you would know that the Quran is horrible towards Christians. You do realize that a lot of, Chris, uh, a lot of the refugees from Syria and Iraq, they're fleeing bombs, they're fleeing torture. Well, why are they fleeing? They should stay at home and rebuild their country. What, in war? Well, we used to have a war. Did we run away? We rebuilt our country. And we didn't go elsewhere and whined. Okay, also wir merken schon, so you can see so ein bisschen, worum es geht und wie es what this is about and how it works. So truth is a very Thema important uh, subject and we're kommen. going to come back to that. Es geht um einfache Gewissheiten, die it's about simple certainties that are being sold as truths. Ängste. And it's about fear that is being mongered or dystopia. Also, so refugees... Threats. And this is a very important point of populism in a very narrow sense. In a broader sense, you could say populism, yeah, part, political parties are always populist in some way, but we're talking about something more specific. It's about the simple certainties, about fears and about simple solutions. This whole thing started with uh, the euro when the common currency was introduced. These days it's more, you know, out with the refugees and then all would be fine. But that can't be right, can it? Because, you know, what would happen if we didn't have the euro? We might have more problems. Lower taxes is another thing that people often want. Or Merkel has to go and all will be well. But who would be next? Seehofer, who's even more conservative. Gabriel, Gabriel, the head of the Social Democrats, von der Leyen. And there are other problems. So some, it's obvious that something always has to go and there's always an exclamation mark somewhere. Something has to go and then suddenly all will be well. But of course that's not how it works. 
auf Rechtspopulismus hier eingehen. Of course, und um, what I want so to speak about most is right-wing populism, and there are three criteria here. Right-wing populism is often about the right of the majority, right of the strongest, which is supposed to rule. Then um, people want a strong state. They want law and order. That's something very that many parties, many right-wing parties have in common. They want to institute law and order. And then there's blame, blame that is being assigned to an unspecified minority, a, a despecified minority, sorry. Ausländer, die gleichgesetzt werden mit Flüchtlingen, natürlich sind so, keine Ausländer Flüchtlinge, die um, werden gleichgesetzt mit Foreigners Moslems, are, auch nicht alle Flüchtlinge Moslems sind, die werden supposed to be equal to refugees, they're equal to Muslims and they're equal to Islamists and they suddenly become equal to terrorists. So suddenly, I mean, of course, none of these things are equal, but Uh, at the end of the day, so foreigners are the same thing as terrorists. Uh, There are some, uh, some other variants of this. There is one uh, variant of this, which is a um, so um libertarian variant. That's not about the right of the majority, but the right of the people, you know, the strongest, if you will. Uh, and they don't want a strong state. It's just about lowering taxes. How those are connected is not quite clear. And there are other despecified minorities. For instance, people who receive public benefits. Someone from the Conservative Party told me earlier this year that um, public officials are to blame because they don't pay health insurance, which is weird because I'm one of them and I do, but anyhow. And then there's left-wing populism, which is a bit of an odd name because it's still right-wing, if you ask me. Um, they claim also to you know, have, a, have the right of the, mon uh, of the majority. Um, they also want a strong state. And of course, it's obvious that there are few rich people and lots of not rich people. But if you ask them who these 1% or 0.1% are, they always say that it's the Rothschilds. And that's a bit bizarre. And of course, the financial system is supported by lots of people who you know, have stakes in companies or who, who receive um, retirement money or pay into the retirement funds. And talking about speech, there is one important aspect that we've already been talking about, the tsunami of refugees. So people have been speaking of a tsunami or of a, an avalanche or of a, a wave or a crisis. And the further you go down this list, the more hits you find on Google if you search for it. So the refugee crisis has become the, uh, the common term. And the hypothesis that I would like to put forth is that this is how the language of populists comes into, turns into common language. Because refugee crisis, so the common term, Term is, might not be as crass and as much of a dysphemism as tsunami, but it's still something that dehumanizes a minority. And that depicts reality in a certain way, which ends up in claims such as this, people who, are, who feel foreign in their own country, which is of course a paradox because your own country is the country in which you are not a foreigner. So the definition of foreigner simply doesn't fit with this definition. But this These paradoxes are something that always shows up, and this is something you're going to see some, you know, a couple more times tonight. 
and there are some words that I've been that I've called bent words because they've been bent out of recognition. You cannot recognize them instantly, and it takes some thought to to understand their something exceptional that is in the you know is used in a right wing context. The first of these is ethno pluralism, which sounds great at first glance. What does it mean? It's, of course, um, used for you know, a fighting term, if you will. And people claim that, yeah, of course, we, we like pluralism, but all the ethnicities should stay where they belong. So, of course, you know, the Africans should stay in Africa. Another term that I didn't understand at first was train station clappers or train station applauders and uh, it's not it's the refugee welcome clappers it's people who welcome people um, welcome refugees who come to, to Germany so there are some strong semantics that you don't understand if you don't belong to that particular filter battle bubble. And then there are reinterpretations where people take words and put them, you know, turn, turn them into a different interpretation. They use a different interpretation of these words where people are suddenly convinced by arguments because they don't fully understand them. One of these is democracy. It's something you often hear, especially in, also in the videos that I'm going to show you. People ask for more democracy, and of course that's something that everybody would want. But if you look at it more closely, then people use certain slights of, you know, etymological slights of hand. So it comes from demos, so we want the, the, the Greek demos, the stance of people. And these people turn this into, we are the people, and this turns into, we want to rule. But of course, democracy also means that you need to support minorities, you need to protect minorities, but this is something that this turns on its head, um, where, you know, which wants to institute a rule of the majority. And they want to, um, they want to remove power from elites, but this is part of, of, of a democracy where, you know, certain people are delegated to, to take responsibility for everyone. Another term is truth. What does truth mean? Truth is what the dictatorship of opinion and the press with their lies tries to suppress. So, it's as if the, something that is being suppressed is, turns into truth simply because it is being suppressed, which is silly, of course. So people want truth and they want freedom of speech as opposed to censorship, which is apparently to be found everywhere. So freedom of speech is being turned on its head and it's being interpreted as you know prote protecting your own opinion. We're going to listen to this now. It's from the same TV show. The press can go and fuck off. And that's, that gives him the right to push me? No, that's not okay. Well, that at least. But you're reporting. You can... You, no, there's no need for your reporting because you don't tell the truth. But if we don't report, then you're going to tell, tell us that we're, being, that we're censoring you. But your, your reports aren't objective. So what are you missing? So please, that's just what I wanted to say. Oh, well, in that case. So what is truth? Not yours, but what's your truth? I don't even know what mine is. Listen to this. This is the truth. And not what our politicians are doing. They're politicians too, but they're not part of the government. So what is your truth again? Not yours. Listen to this. 
Ich verstehe es nicht. Lass mir es. I don't get it. Let's, let's not do this. Ernsthaft? Wie können Sie denn eine Lösung aussehen? How, how, what could a solution look like? Ja. Also, so, obviously, well, truth is that which is being oppressed, but so if it's if it's censored, that is what must be the truth. So that's what what is revealed here. Uh, remember 1984, war is, pre, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. So. You can say not, ignorance is, is strength, and that's the, also the um, subtitle of my next part, where you can also see semantic shifts or changes in, in meaning. So, good mensch, that just means a good, a good person, but has been changed in its meaning. So, if you look at the Google a trend search here, this, this, uh, the term has been in existence uh, for a while, uh, of course, uh, as a political term, but in the, la in the recent years, you can really see the development in 2000. 12 uh, to 14, there's a real peak in 2014. So basically, the original idea was that it, um, this is a kind of naive, uh, idealistic person, bon, le bonhomme in, in French, the benevolence, basically. But this has completely turned around. So now the good men are, are the bad guys. So... They've become, uh, uh, the, the good people have become spokespeople uh, of the man, of the bad guys, and make, to make it things worse, they are using, well, the language, the politically correct language, another, another negative image, um, and also a, a, a battle cry just to, to make a statement and say, we are against this, this, uh, politically correct terminology, which is a political term in itself, of course. So I just looked for a few examples of, of this. For instance, tolerance, fascism, language fascism. But the sad thing is I just found no instances of tolerance with the correct spelling. It was always with the double L, which is why I indicated it in brackets here. So, a while ago, a journalist asked me, how, how do you recognize fake news? And I replied, well, actually, the typos and the, the grammar errors um, are quite good indication, but, of course, the obverse doesn't necessarily... It doesn't work the other way around, necessarily. So I don't want to uh, bash people with, with spelling weakness, and I have tendencies of that to towards that myself, but I think you can observe that uh, if you are not that strong a writer in terms of grammar, well, the thing to do is that to have at least another uh, person look at it, and usually there are correction mechanisms in place, at least in published texts, and if these errors go all the way through, you can, well, assume that it might be fake news. Um, another, another term which has been made, turned into a very negative um, ideological term is, is gender and all related expressions, gender mainstreaming, for example, which basically just means um, making gender as an issue visible in, in policy, in public. But what we see here is that something very specific is, is referenced here. Uh, genderism. There are isms made out of this gender ideology and gender madness and even uh, gender fascism. So this is the, the discourse environment. So, uh, well, what, what do these people actually mean uh, by by fascism. Are they talking about one gender being repressed, discriminated against? No, we're talking about language. 
Say for instance, as gender mainstreaming um, supposes we can we can make differences in in gender visible in language in choices of pronouns, for example, and that even is well referred to as gender fascism. So another interesting word. So. Strangely enough, early sexualization is is this uh, is, is this expression. Strangely enough, uh, sexualization as such uh, as a standalone word doesn't exist as much only in this combination. And again, uh, the Google Trends 2006. There was a discussion in Switzerland. In, in the German-speaking countries, but then 2011, you can see it's increasing and it was picked up from uh, from side uh, right-wing sides. This was all about, uh, well, basically education, sex ed at school. And this was the beginning of this discussion, um, people talking about children being sexualized too early on, but why are we talking about, well, making something sexual, but why early, early sexualization? So you're just alleging or dropping hints that there is something to do with, uh, there's some stigma attached, something to do with pedophiles or um, kids being abused somehow, but no, this the whole talk is just about sex ed in schools. So, folk is a, a, a very uh, difficult term that suddenly uh, uh, reappeared in the in the discussion. Of the, ba the basis of this adjective is folk, the the the, the, the people, the the population of a nation state, and this it goes back to uh, the the German Enlightenment philosopher Fichte. 18th, 19th century, and Fichte um, uh, said that Völkisch, the Deutsch, um, the word for Deutsch, German, uh, he traces back to the the old German, Germanic diota, which also means people. So the Deutsch actually means the German, the, the adjective Deutsch, he claims goes all the way back to the word for population. So he claims that Völkisch is actually synonymous with Deutsch, German. So used synonymously with national, for instance, or pertaining to the German nation state. But, of course, in the 20th century, this expression was, well, made another development. You can see here in the, in the, around the First World War, or this was also used in the context, in an anti-Semitic sense, uh, to mean explicitly not Jewish, not Semitic. And of course, you can see in the 1930s or 40s um, the well the increased importance of this uh, terminology in national socialism. So 2016 looks quite similar. So you can see a similar peak in 2000, mid 2016. So you have a bit of discussion. Something happened, and then there's a bit of debate around it, and then it just kind of peters out and disappears from 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 the discourse. Well, another related term where things developed a bit differently, uh, but you can also see the word folk in here in umfolkung. So this means refolking, repeopling an area. So geographically. Um, is the implied meaning. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, but what happens now is um, in, in recent times, uh, this is, Umfolkung is used as a terminology to replace the world, um, the more generic terms for, for overpopulation. Um, so, the whole idea of a populace and make, turning this into, uh, into politics, into policy, is go, of course goes back to national socialism. Someone called Albert Brachtmann 
Uh, alles wieder Deutsch, and there were so, there were of course su suggest suggestions to to uh, Germanize um, to well clear up a populace basically um, or actively make people move. Uh, that's what the the Umfolkung refers to people literally moving around to get back to where they apparently or allegedly belong. So, but what's new is that uh, this discussion is being led again, that um, people moving here, the, the composition of the, of the population changes and the, the spin is now that in, uh, in Germany and Austria, um, these shifts in population are happening and this is a supposed, well, active move. But this victim role is very interesting in, in, in this uh, folk and repopulation context and we'd like to hear some, some quotes here directly from Pegida. So again, we are going to hear the truth from, from the interviewee. So, well, what, what is it what you, what you want? Well, we, we ha people have to be enlightened, people have to be informed that we don't have a sovereign government, that uh, they're all under orders from Tel Aviv and, and Washington, and we're being governed by a Jewish lobby. That's not that's not populism. That's uh, that's fact. And uh, the Democrats are financing the Democrats. But with what right is the population being switched around, being exchanged, even if we don't have? The, the sovereignty and if even academics have to move from one internship to the next, that's all uh, the, the, the economic lobby to blame. How many times shall I apply? Well, how is that to change? Well, well, look, look at what's coming from the people. I was defamed. I was criticized for saying you should catch all the refugees in the Mediterranean already. And you know what people said? They said I was a Nazi. And but the Australian government is already doing that all the all the time. Oh, do, is, is anyone calling them Nazis? Or is all Australia Nazi? And well, if someone comes here, we have to have a perspective, but we don't have that perspective. But we don't have any space and we don't have any jobs. I have a look around. So 70, 80 percent, they're not even German. I don't have anything against other nations or cultures, but it's uh, impossible that all these, uh, the wars uh, from the Islamic State are are being fueled by the United States, and if you if you publish this interview, well, I'm really interested if you're going to keep your job. Thank you. Yeah. So finally, the truth. Now we know it. So, George Soros, notably, uh, important to remember that he uh, didn't support Trump and Soros is actually, uh, Bush didn't support, well, and his name isn't, isn't Jewish, etc., but so it's all a bit uh, conspiracy. But what, what we're, what we're seeing here from this speaker is that he's trying to get behind something, to, to get to the bottom of something. And so people do enjoy practicing a bit of etymology going to the roots of, of words and right populists like to do this as well. So there's another expression false, of a false uh, etymology and interestingly enough in Germany you say that's a folk, folk etymology. So basically we have uh, the example we had before folkish um, is not exactly the adjective to folk, to people. So it, 
Deutschland sei kein souveräner Staat. And we have, well, we, are, we have the story here with a, um, a sovereign nation of Germany. It's a well-known conspiracy theory. That Germany is not, in fact, a country, but an enterprise. Um, and they have the strangest claims, like saying that, for instance, the, the ID card, the Personalausweis, um, well, is called that way because we're all employees in the Germany business. So let's um, get to the bottom of this with somebody who qualifies as a populist, at least in this instance. This is Seehofer, the uh, head of the... Bavarian Conservative Party. The readers of my blog Neusprech.org know the solution already because accidentally I published the article before this talk. But we, we're going to see. We are convinced that this big historic task of integrating refugees into our country and that the support, that the popular support is not going to be available unless we get, unless we um, cap the influx of refugees. Thundering applause, well, apparently Everybody agrees with him. Horst Seehofer and Angela Merkel have always found a solution to everything. If this is going to be the motto of the coming weeks, then you, you'll be warmly in invited back. I have to show you the rest of this. I have to show you the rest of this. So we, they were talking about a cap, about an upper limit. And you, you hear this and you think, oh, you know, right-wing people think, ah, Seehofer, he's trying to keep out refugees. He's trying to limit the influx of refugees. And that might motivate them to vote for his party. But that's not exactly what he means. We published this on our blog on the 7th of December. And then a week later, Horst Seehofer explains what he means. But it doesn't, it's, it's still not very obvious because he, it's, it's been covered up with other things he says that are going to make, make headline news. But what he actually means becomes obvious in this. So it was not just the Chancellor, but many people in your party said that there is not going to be a cat, but you said it has to become part of, you know, it has to become part of our government. Well, ever since I've been a politician, people have told me this is not going to happen, and then at the end of the day, it actually does happen. For more than a year, I've offered the federal government to send Bavarian police people to the borders, to patrol the borders, and they've denied this all this time. But and suddenly they, they asked us to actually do this. And this is going to happen in this instance as well. We are going to get to a cap. And this is a very important point for my party. And we guarantee the people that in case we're going to be part of the government, that this is going to become part of our policies. So, like, do you think this is going to be able to convince them of this? Well, yeah, we've had many, many instances of this um, where, uh, this, where the Conservatives, you know, said, yeah, this is going to happen, and then it didn't happen because it would have been unfair. And 
and we need to see, we, we need to make, make sure that this task, which concerns something that is going to happen, is going to keep stay with us for many years, that we need to make sure that we can guarantee that our, to our people that they're going to be safe. And this can be done by capping the influx of refugees. This is part of humanity. Good. Also of, inter of, of integration. So about this cap, how can, how can he say that? How can he guarantee these things? Well, he clearly stated it in this interview. He said it's about capping immigration, which is not the same thing as refugees, because immigration is about integrating people and um, giving them German citizenship. And he wants to cap this, but that's not what the soldiers discussion is about, but this is what but what people hear is something very different. You know, the people who, who are in these right-wing circles, they hear, oh, good, no more refugees, this is great. But that's not what he was actually talking about. He doesn't want to cap the influx of refugees. Although he also proposes transit zones, but no, what he's talking about is immigration, but the people, you know, right-wing people hear that he's he wants to limit refugees, and of course because of this, it's not also not problem, uh, there's also no no constitutional problem because he's speaking so, uh, simply about immigration and not about refugees. So people hear something that he's not actually saying. And this is a bit concerning. Something else I've heard in a chat show and which um, shows that something went wrong is that multiculturalism has failed. Multikulti, which should be, a, it should be a noun, but it doesn't have an article. A bit like cyber, cyber is similar to multiculti because you can't put an, you know, you can't put the multiculti in front of it. We need a category for these words, and I'm going to call them pseudo-nouns that can't really be described as nouns, and that makes it hard to know what they're supposed to mean. Another word, or another part of a word that I consider one of my words of the year is critical, which apparently shows that populism is spreading, that populist ways of arguing are actually falling onto fertile ground. So this has been in, in um, very widely circulated German newspapers. Words like critical of gays, critical of asylum, critical of immigration. It's easy to find if you Google for it. These are words you can actually find in, in our press. And of course, they're wrong. There is such a thing as criticism of religion. It's something that people often practice who belong to that religion because they want to know what the true belief is. If you you're critical of Islam, then you're just, you know, you just reject Islam. You're not treating it critically. You're not thinking about it critically. Critical of asylum, that also doesn't mean that maybe they're not being treated in, you know, maybe the conditions in which they're treated aren't good. No, what you mean is that asylum is wrong. And criticism of homosexu homosexuality doesn't mean that certain aspects of homosexuality are better than others. Um, no, it's simply hostility towards homosexuality or immigration, asylum or Islam. But they don't call themselves hostile, they call themselves critical. And this is this is very common language in the press. The same thing with concerned citizens or concerned parents, which is something that you can just, you know, read in the newspaper or hear in the evening news, and nobody questions it. Another interesting thing is that um, concerned citizens it only appears, only ever appears in the male gender in German. 
So the concerned parents are possibly hostile to homosexuals. And then there's, of course, post-fact or post-truth. And FIFA earlier talked asked me what um, you know about some distinctions about these of, of these terms. Fake news might be neutral, but fake news, like post-truth, are, of course, uh, weakened words, because fake news is not news, it's simply wrong information. It's simply propaganda, and post-truth is even worse, because it's, it's essentially lies, but you don't call them lies, you call them post-truth. And there's an epistemological background to all of this, which is there are, there's a very important distinction between natural sciences and social sciences. <coughs> because natural sciences wants to... Well, they use the terms antifactum and postfactum about explanations that you can produce sometimes only have you know, before or after the fact. It's, you know, about this weird debate of natural versus cultural and phenomena that are not predictable. But this is where this comes from. Angela Merkel would know this term, you know, after the fact explanation, because uh, she studied physics. So post-truth, yes, which is in German being translated as post-factual, Post-truth. Uh, you can. Post-truth appears for the first time in a New York Times article in August 2016. And then there's a reappearance in the Economist in September, 17th of September. And then it creeps into German, post-factual, but it's still fairly insignificant. Then there's another post-truth peak when Trump gets elected. It does really reappear afterwards. And then suddenly the federal chancellor says post-factual and um, everybody Googles it and there's this massive peak and it becomes word of the year in Germany. So it's fairly obvious that there's a certain connotation here and it even surpasses the usage of post-truth. These are not German trends, these are worldwide trends, so you'd expect post-truth to eclipse post-factual, but that's not what we see. Post-factual actually eclipses post-truth. So the problem with post-factual is that it minimizes things, it softens things, it displays things that are wrong as simply post-factual and weakens them in that way, but it's a term that everybody uses it, and I've been hearing it even at this Congress, and it's, you know, you can, you, you read it all the time, even though it's not really the right word to use. And I think where our political opponent is arming themselves, we shouldn't simply use their words, we should use stronger words, we should use contrafactual or simply lies, and this is something, this is a recommendation that I would like to make to you. So on one hand, we should question the concepts. If somebody wants, comes up to you and wants to discuss with you, I had a panel talk um, that didn't go so well earlier this year. I don't recommend it you to watch it. I sat on a podium 
It was about uh, queer politics, and there was a right-wing politician who started, you know, auf der einen Seite natürlich die Flüchtlinge das queere Leben zerstören werden. Who told how refugees are going to destroy queer life, and in order to protect queers, you need to do something about the refugees. But he also said that early sexualization is wrong. You don't have to teach children that there are different ways of living. So the, there was this double speak. He he's hostile towards queers, but he's also hostile towards immigrants. And suddenly, then in that instance, he was pro queer. It's bizarre. And, you need to question what you need to question the meaning behind it. When somebody says we are critical of immigration, then you know, talk to them about it. If they say the truth is being suppressed, ask them what truth. I think there's a lot you can do here. There's a lot to gain. And there's also a lot to gain in thinking about what you say. And this is not fascism, it's simply speaking in a more considerate way. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Ihr kennt euch aus. Ähm, noch nicht rausrennen. Don't leave yet. We're not that quick. We're going to have a Q&A section. Which of, who of you has questions? Or does the internet have questions? Are there any questions coming in? Es kommen gerade welche rein. Yes, we have questions coming in. Yeah, the internet is a bit slow. Na gut. Bitte dann die zwei. Microphone number two. Ja, ähm, ist dir schon der, hast du dich schon mit dem ziemlich skurrilen Begriff have you, befasst? Cons, have you, have you thought about the term Bio-Deutsch, Bio-German, Organic German? Bei meinen Recherchen ist mir der auch untergekommen. Ja, I stumbled over that a couple of times in the course of my research. I didn't, I didn't include it here, but I think uh, I agree it's a very interesting term because Bio as in organic, German, um, Bio is a very uh, well, positive word, for instance, even when it's not really suitable, for instance, uh, Bio, Diesel. But but in, in this context, it, it means um, something else, autochthonous, or being in Germany for several generations. That's what it implies, so sort of um, nationality as an inherited trait. This is what it refers to, but, uh, but I have to be perfectly honest. I didn't include it in my, in my corpus just for this examination, because I'm not exactly sure where this... Um, term is, is, is going, really. I mean, I'm looking for, for evidence or looking for indications of, of who's using these expressions, what um, is the intention of these pieces of speech. So I did find, uh, find it more in the offside um, media, right-wing blogs and social media, and not necessarily in uh, standard larger media, but I thought I wasn't too clear on the semantics, and so I just left it out. I know something about this. I looked at it a couple of years ago. The first person to use this word was a green politician, Shem Özdemir. That's... That's all about that. I'll look into that. Is there a rhetorical pattern that you can use when you sit with people who always contradict themselves but still talk in a populist way, what, what pattern do you recommend to join a conversation with them or should you simply leave? Well, if in doubt, leave. Well, that's the thing about the filter bubble, isn't it? Just 
because some me words have for different meanings. Um, um well, there are limited options for, for communications because if you want to exchange uh, knowledge or communicate, you have to um, be talking about the same thing. So if, if one person says, well, if I say uh, democracy, I mean this and that, and the other person uh, means something entirely different, I think, well, the, the solution is obviously you can, you can go away, but if you, if you, want, to go, uh, if you want to go there, I think it's important to ask very precisely and say, well, what is your truth? And if they said, well, not yours, and she asks again and said, what, well, what is it then? And if something happens there, this is only an excerpt, of course, um, but you can look at the entire clip on, on the internet. Uh, well, just questioning and recapping and being exact. So if uh, then you get to the statement of the US is, is uh, steering us and manipulating us, well, that's exactly the way to, to go. Einmal die Frage aus dem Internet, bitte. Es gibt mehrere Fragen. Die erste the Internet has several questions. The first of them is are terms like post-factual or conspiracy theories um, not, are they good for democracy because they're, they're an easy way to end the discussion? Are they bad for democracy? Oh, it's me well. That, that is a difficult question. Personally, I don't think post-factual in this, in this sense that's being used is just something to avoid. I don't think you, uh, you are terminating a discussion prematurely by using a word like this, but this is a, well, euphemis, a euphemism. Uh, in and the, uh, quite m maybe even a possibility of keeping the, the, the conversation Klar, going in a softer way. So, I do, I mean, I understood your question in the sense, if you say, well, uh, once, yeah, once you say, oh, this is all post-truth, uh, post then that says it's all, it's all rubbish and uh, we have, don't have anything left to talk about. But this, of course, is, depends on how much do you want to invest, how many emotions and, and time uh, do you want to, to make available for this. But the intentions of certain speakers uh, are something well, that are hard to, to assume and to just guess, do guesswork. So I think it's very important to know exactly what you're talking about. And if in doubt, you can just jump out of the, the debate. About the term post-factual, post-truth, it comes from an article in The Economist and it was about a certain style of politics and the article claimed that truth no longer is no longer important. It's simply about emotion. So is this about untruths or is it about new style of, of politics? Well, yeah, this uh, Economist article, yes, it was about pol style of politics um, and also about this, uh, this word post-factual, also post-truth. But what I meant is that the, the, the politics that's being done or the, the style, I'm, I'm talking about the use of the word post-factual. Uh, in the German sense. So it, it, there is a relation to, to fake news, even though this is only, first of all, an adjective, a description of the political style, um, policies and emotions that have changed just in, in public discourse, but then, well, actually, we're in the middle of populism already. Uh, that, that's what populism means, that you're doing politics with, with emotions, and that's what this new uh, po um, political style means, a populist style, working with emotions versus fact. That's what, what I had at the beginning, the simple truths, uh, the simple easy convictions, because that's the kind of, uh, gives a sense of security or comfort. Um, well, I know I have my certainty and, um, for instance, the, 
Spiritual, also allein selig machen, ist natürlich nicht die Lösung. Ne? Und das the, ist eben the, genau dieses Arbeiten mit Gefühlen, was man eigentlich nicht will. The, das ist nicht, independent das income nicht support, auf Fakten. Um, aber die Verwendung von Faustfakten ist, ist jetzt schon endorsed, but the way it's talked about is, also da geht es schon well, it's um Äußerungen. all going in, in the direction of fake news and how do you evaluate a certain... Mikrofon 4, bitte. Hallo, du hast gerade äh, verschiedene Begriffe gezeigt, well Flüchtlingsschwemme, äh, Flüchtlingskrise und so weiter. You use terms like in den um, letzten Wochen refugee crisis or youth refugee in den Medien oft verwendet wird. Ja. Und Wave. das erinnert mich ein bisschen an I realize that the term Frage. So refugee question so has been cropping up more and more, which reminds me of the Jewish question, which was used by the Nazis. And the only thing I'm waiting for now is the final solution to the question, to the refugee question. Do you, do you think that is going to happen? Um, I, I, I will look up the, the context of this, uh, this, this phrase, Flüchtlings Frage, the refugee question, which is a... Ja, neutraler als But Krise. I do, I do uh, so think also even so, maybe the semantics is isn't well as harsh because just a question, just an issue is something which is a lot milder than maybe the, the crisis or the, 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 the deluge. But of course that association is there because we know the uh, Nazi terminology of the, the Jewish question and I hadn't in fact noticed that, so thank you for that. Eine Frage aus dem Internet. Question from the Internet. Was ist deiner Meinung nach die Ursache für die Verschiebung What der Argumentation weg von the Fakten hin zu einer emotionalen Variante? Behind the shift towards a more Nein, emotional Strategie. Also vielleicht haben wir nicht deutlich genug gemacht. Also sind hier Leute, well, die tatsächlich eine Strategie haben. The, das the, wird ja immer Strategy, of course, and maybe I didn't make that clear enough. Nicht so sehr die uh, these are people who, well, bringen, die are going somewhere with this. Uh, this is, of course, ja individual party politicians who have their agenda. Das ist unsere Strategie. And our strategy is first and foremost provoking kommen. and getting ja, also so a foot in the door, getting Seite, our, foot, ja, our little niche in this discourse. Medien, so we have two sides. We have uh, just getting topics into the media, the way you to talk about ja, phrases and issues, uh, and also just the plain old provocation to say, folkish has to be a word we can use again, make it great again. I've been hearing the criticism that public discourse is being prevented by because people are, people are using strong terms for other people that aren't very fitting. So, you know, people who are against the against marriage for everyone are being called homophobes or similar similar claims with racism, not homophobia. What, what do you think about this? Does this prevent discourse and how can I answer this if I don't agree? Das ist in der Tat äh, ja, eine schwierige Sache. Also, ich meine, ich habe ja auch hier vertreten, Clearly a, a Leute, difficult die, question. Äh, I mean, wenn sowas sagen wie I'm äh, ja, Schwulen, convinced that, äh, kritisch, well, people who, for instance, say I'm gay, critical, of course I'm convinced Klar, that they might äh, use another word, preferably. Ja, also eine ganz Geschichte. Also man But sich it's, genau a, it's a difficult wer da question. So also maybe it's worthwhile to look gesagt, at who is, is the gut, person talking there. Sometimes it's beneficial gut, if you don't actually also auf dieser pick Ebene up that discourse and just make it clear that's not the level I want to talk at or just ask an open question. What are, do you mean? What are you referring to? What do you mean by I reject um, marriage for everyone and I am pro-marriage only between man and woman? You can always look at what someone is saying and was gegen die gleichgeschlechtliche Ehe hat, also dieser maybe judge people by, if people ja use a certain expression, Ende they Diskurses, might glaube, be sagen, referring quite directly to the fact that they are against ist, gay marriage, for instance. But to then um, 
say these people are gay critical. I think this isn't accurate.